I'm Gregory Leffel. This is Empire of Confusion. I interpret the intention of this year's forum this way, to examine the relationship between Jesus and the first century Roman Empire as a model, ethic, and example, and then admitting that our present world and its power structures are a great deal different from ancient Rome to ask how Jesus model, ethic, and example can inform our mission now in witness to imperial power in the 21st century. I take imperialism to be the extended historical process of the concrete systematic structuring <clears throat> of the world into a particular geostructural world order. And I take empire to be the structural product of this imperial process. Empire, whether it's a regional world order, such as the ancient Rome of biblical days, or in its present day globalized form, sets the hegemonic horizon that captivates our gaze and orients our entire modes of life. Its influence pervades all, an acid dripping into every part of life. It is a global ecosystem of hidden and decentered powers that emerge into sight only as we experience them in any number of ways and everywhere. Empire creates the entire backdrop against which we which, against which our day-to-day -day activities, as well as our counter-imperial resistances, gain visibility and take shape. And this is true whether we identify our missional activism as anti-systemic or as anti-hegemonic or anti-neoliberal or post-colonial, decolonial, environmental, or as global justice activism, including its racial, gender, and ethnic formations. Or properly, this is infinite, of course, to take all of them together as an integral whole to produce an integral mission set against a common, systematically integrated global empire. Our actually existing empire that is our singular, uniquely structured, globalized world order is far from a conceptual generalization. Its formative processes over 500 years of primarily Western imperialism created a particular kind of empire, a uniquely one-off uh, global historical uh, formation consisting of unique structures, regimes of power, ideologies, and dare I say it, its own spirituality. Very briefly then, I want to survey a critical theory of empire. I will single out three of empire's historically specific crises that beset and bedevil us. These metaphysical, structural, and spiritual acids are burning through our present world order. But paradoxically, these crises, crises also hold keys to unlocking our liberation from empire. This is our missional challenge, as we will see. Number one, the crisis on the inside, nihilism. In the late 19th century, Nietzsche defined nihilism as the, quote, devaluation of our highest values. He meant that societies, even empires, are organized by networks of value. Values are arranged in hierarchies, and value hierarchies are anchored at the top by primary values, values such as God, reason, science, or tradition. These primary values provide every social order with a commonly shared intuitive point of view that is, with a nearly unspoken and consensual metaphysical unity. But if a social order loses faith in its highest values, its inner coherence unravels into an anarchy of disordered values. By famously proclaiming that God is dead, 
Nietzsche warned us that the West had already altogether lost faith in transcendent, transcendent primary metaphysical values. For that reason, in a post-Christendom world, we will lose any convincing consensual way to organize our moral and ethical values, to adjudicate claims to truth, or to secure political values other than through the will to power. And given the West global imperial dominance, that this would become a problem for the entire world. Now with eerie prescience, Nietzsche predicted that the West's imperial modernity, which was replacing Christendom, would too eventually unravel in the 20th century, ushering in a period that today we call post-modernity. So prescient was his analysis that cultural critic Terry Eagleton puts postmodern theory entirely down to, quote, a footnote to Nietzsche. Under the conditions of nihilism, values have no natural source other than the will to create them. That no conceptual foundation exists upon which to stand to take in the universal view of the world. The world as such exists in no special way or another, only in our interpretations of it. And that our worlds are mere perspectives. Further, Nietzsche considered that it might take another 200 years of confused fragmentation before a new metaphysical reality can once again knit together our values, ethics, and politics to create a new and confident world order. Meanwhile, Nietzsche thought, nihilism will work out its disintegrating magic in two frightening ways. First, there would remain one value that does indeed survive nihilism, the value of not having values at all, the valorization of individual autonomy, an obsession with individual freedom, the value to choose what one wants without reference to others. Second, this will be followed by, quote, the reserve to do away with the concept of the state. As Nietzsche argued, quoting again, private companies will step by step absorb the business of the state, even the most resistant reminder, remainder of what was formerly the work of government will in the long run be taken care of by private companies. Two, disabling democratic politics or neoliberalism. Nothing fits Nietzsche's devalued nihilist nightmare better than our current neoliberal global political economy, which is itself the ultimate world encompassing structural product of the imperial age. Neoliberal theorists long have argued that the global freewheeling free market laissez-faire capitalism of the high imperial age remains a much more efficient political economy than do the later social democracies and democratic welfare states or planned economies that were designed to rein in the markets and soften their excesses. Thus, neoliberals seek to prevent social welfare democracies from distorting global markets by redistributing wealth to their citizens and guaranteeing full employment. This the neoliberals consider a political manipulation of markets. Market or welfare economies were famously demonized by F.A. Hayek as, quote, the road to serfdom. And he castigated majoritarian democracy um, and demands for equality and social justice as, quote, fatal conceits. By the 1980s surge of economic globalization, neoliberal ideology became established consensus globally, the closest thing the postmodern world order has had to a central organizing metaphysics. If earlier, the modern political economy had tied its legitimacy to regulating capitalism in welfare state regimes, by contrast, 
the postmodern capitalist political economy dropped the political from consideration almost to the exclusion of earlier welfare concerns and the consideration of class conflict. So complete was this political erasure that global neoliberal capitalism has claimed the entire postmodern ideological background. Or as Frederick Jameson famously put it, postmodernism is nothing other than, quote, the cultural logic of late capitalism. And politics was fatally weakened as a source of anti-imperial power. Three, a confusion of class and culture. If nihilism dissolved the bonds of political vision, unity, and consensus, and further unearthed the raw will to power behind individual freedom, and if globally neoliberalism reduced our highest values to mere economic values and further reduced politics to the protection of private property rights alone, then where can people turn to resist empire without the benefit of a broadly shared political project to guide them? And to further confuse the situation, there also remains a conflict between radical anti-imperialist political visions based on either class or culture. Between, we might say, the old left Marxists and the new left Nietzscheans. Certainly, we can turn to class revolution or to something like it. Many believe that when the workers of the world unite, a new politics of the people will emerge on its own. Traditionally, anti-imperialism has been identified with the political old left of Marxists and less radically with the organized labor movement and social democracy. Into the 1960s, even in liberal societies, it was taken for granted that the capitalist world order is structurally divided by class. But in the 1960s, the West deindustrialized and class antagonism became confused. Anti-imperial resistance went another direction. A new left turned to culture and identity as the organizing center of a new rights-based politics and it drew its energy from the formerly colonized who at long last were recovering their histories and making their voices heard. The decolonialization movement exposed imperialism's semi underside to the rest of the world. In graphic terms, it described the extent of imperialism's willful destruction of indigenous peoples, languages, and knowledges, that is genocide and epistemicide, the noxious, demeaning, paternalist racism, slavery, and violence that defined the imperial system, environmental plunder, despoilation, and pollution of colonized lands and living spaces, the destruction of, of traditional agricultures and economies. Decolonialization demanded self-determination, recognition, restitution, and reparation. It also created a framework to globalize civil rights movements, creating international solidarities and vitalizing identities among diasporas of the formerly colonized and enslaved. Anti-imperial activism shifted its attention away from class to the task of repairing the material and epistemic damage imperialism had wrought, turning, that is, to the task of making traditional peoples and their worlds whole again. Through a decolonial cultural lens, it became clear that individual identity and self-awareness are not formed autonomously on their own, but are formed from within distinct local historical relationships. This gives new meaning to collective identities, to cultural solidarities, to unique epistemologies that bind in individuals to their cultural roots, roots that must be protected for individuals to maintain authentic identities and a confident sense of place in the world. 
culture became understood to be central to individual consciousness and pluralist societies were reconceived to recognize and to defend cultural differences. In fact, societies were recast as multicultural mosaics rather than as melting pots of autonomous citizen individuals. From this, we have cultivated a radical politics of recognition and difference. But this also opens a delicate political question. Are these differences signs that we live in different metaphysical realities? That we live in incommensurable worlds, substantially closed off to one another? That our worlds are segregated by regimes of power? Nietzsche and postmodernists mostly agree that they are. So then we must build a new anti-systemic politics as a democracy of groups instead of a democracy of individuals. But in doing so, will we still face the same nihilism that beset us before, the same incapacity to create a common system of values anchored by consensual metaphysics? Optimistically, we might negotiate our epistemological differences in our various concepts of justice, at worst, we might resolve our civil conflicts through tests of strength and threats of violence. It's hard to be optimistic here. Anti-democratic culture wars abound. And in the background remains the complicating, simmering epistemological divide between the class-based old left and the culturalist new left, which post-modernity has failed to bridge. Now, last the future. Nihilism undermines metaphysical consensus. Neoliberalism undermines consensual politics. And divisions between class and culture destabilize anti-imperial solidarity. Can we bring competing visions of the world together to forge a reasonable, workable, metaphysical consensus to contest empire? let me suggest two emerging signs of hope. First, a spate of American writers of color have recently reconsidered our underlying assumptions about socioeconomic class in relation to race, gender, and ethnicity, an attempt to uh, resolve the old, old left versus new left tension. Toure Reed and his father, Adolph Reed Jr., both of them political theorists, argue that in fact, African-Americans and other minorities made their fastest material gains when the civil rights movement was allied with the labor movement. This was a durable unity of class and culture from the 1930s to the 1960s. In retrospect, we might think of it as a bridging over of the conceptual gulf between Marxist universalist materialism and Nietzschean postmodern culturalism in favor of a workable solidarity. Political philosopher Olufemi Taiwo warns that identity politics today are too easily co-opted by ruling elites. He calls this elite capture simply because identity and diversity don't threaten elite neoliberal structures of economic power. What we need, he says, is a radical restructuring of the entire political economy to rebalance power relationships and better distribute wealth. Scholar activists Heather McGee and Ian Haney Lopez provide research showing that inequality is best addressed politically as a solidarity of race, ethnicity, gender, and the working class. Second, there is the problem of the future. Political philosopher Hans Sluge writes that many of the problems I've been discussing are, quote, normal problems. Um, problems that, if we are willing, we can, in fact, resolve by historically normal political means. But he distinguishes these from, quote, wicked problems upon which we have no historical political traditions to draw to address them. 
These wicked problems are three and they are global in scope. First, climate change and its reduction of habitable space for human flourishing. Second, population growth, which within itself is not a problem, but shrinking prospects for sustainable agriculture and access to water threatens widespread migration and violent suppression. And third, technology, especially artificial intelligence and bioengineering, which will transform our means of production as well as our human species identity and which threaten um, uh, and, and which threaten to destabilize our existing world order. Our entire global imperial world order is threatened in ways that imperil every person and cultural group, no matter their epistemology, metaphysics, and tradition. So where is the ray of hope here? Well, counterintuitively, it lies in the fact that looming threats scare us. They are slowly forcing us to change our minds about how we interpret the world. This is a natural human reflex and to be welcomed, and it affects us individually and emotionally, whether we are alert to it or not. The threat of global perils from the future already invades our consciousness, no matter who we are. Such are signs that a new global consciousness, new possibilities for solidarity, and dare I say it, a new metaphysics and spirituality is slowly emerging around us, forced upon us by the future at a planetary scale. Many around the world, I'd say most, have grown sick of the nihilist postmodern individualism, neoliberal or imperial neoliberalism, and political, political culture warring of the last 50 years. There remains a human longing to subvert our existing imperial world order for the common good, to rebuild our highest values, to re-energize human agency, to achieve even rough consensus and solidarity, and most importantly, to rekindle the utopian energies that can set us on a cooperative path to liberation a path towards creating a world that can survive the looming valley of the shadow of death. For mission in the image of Jesus's model, ethic, and example, to take first mover advantage in witnessing to this emerging metaphysical vision to repair the world should be obvious. <laughs>